Okay, welcome everyone to the beginning of our second day of our 39th annual conference here at the Anthropology of Consciousness, our first fully virtual one. My name is Andy Gervich. I'm the president of the organization. And we are excited for a jam-packed second day, starting with this wonderful panel, The Shape of Change, Addressing Possibilities and Limitations to Transformation. I'm speaking to you today from Portland, Oregon. Uh, I want to do a land acknowledgement to start us off. Uh, Portland rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, the Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapula, Malala, and many other tribes and bands as the original caretakers of this land. We wish to begin our time together by acknowledging their presence, their dignity, and their continued struggle for respect, restoration, and reparations. We wouldn't be here today if they weren't here first. We wouldn't be here today if they weren't displaced after having been here first. And so our hope as an organization uh, is to do our part to help reconcile that. Um, a couple things to point out. Uh, if you're attending and presenting, please have the chat window open. We will be uh, dropping lots of things into the chat throughout the day, um, starting here pretty quickly about future sessions, um, all manner of information, what to do with questions, what to do if you have a question about the conference, uh, upcoming events, and so make sure you have that chat window open. Um, a webinar uh, format that we are in, which means the presenters have their cameras and their microphones on, but you attendees do not. And so um, if you want to interact with us, the best way to do it is in the chat feature. You can interact with us and with the panelists and with each other through that. And then if you have a question for the panelists, I would uh, appreciate it if you would roll it into the Q&A. If you roll your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should have a, a series of options there. And on the far right, almost to the far right, um, you have a Q&A option. Uh, please put your questions there because we can then get the panelists will be able to see them and we can gather them and ask them at the time. Um, we also have a few other options. If you end up dropping a question in the chat, especially towards the end, we can see it there as well. Uh, and if you really feel the need that you'd like to speak directly to the participants, you can use the raised hand option and then we can turn your audio and maybe even video on if we need to as well. Um, two other things and then we'll hand the session over to uh, Mark Flanagan to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have live captioning option for you. And so if you look across the bottom of your screen right next to that Q&A uh, function, there's something that says CC live transcript. You can click on that and turn on captioning. It's only in English, I believe, uh, but you might be able to change it actually by going down to subtitle settings. So I take that back. If you click on it, uh, you'll turn it on. And then if you click on subtitle settings, you can adjust those to make the language bigger. And I think you can change the language. Um, and lastly, um, if, you are so moved, uh, we would uh, offer a soft ask for you to go up to uh, your name in the panelists uh, section. If you click on um, participants, so not panelists, excuse me, if you click on participants, you'll see a list of everyone who's participating and you can see your name. And if you click on next to it, you'll be able to change it. And I would ask two things that you have your name match either exactly, Mark would prefer exactly, or as close to exactly to the name that you're registered in the conference under. Um, so we know who you are. We're not trying to kick anybody out, but we just want to know who's here and what's going on so we can keep the session nice and, and secure. Uh, and then if you uh, would like to, to help us make the session more inclusive and accessible, you can add your preferred pronouns like some folks have already done, but that's not a requirement, but we would love it if you would. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn the session over to Dr. Mark Flanagan to introduce our panelists and welcome again, everyone. Thank you so much, Andy, really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, so great to see everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Flanagan. I am the uh, program chair for our, this conference. Um, we're really grateful to have everyone here. <laughs> um, this panel is really excited about that. Uh, this is uh, our second, um, collection of student presentations, also from Florida. So yesterday we had University of Miami. Um, so we've had some great Florida representation. Um, Daniel uh, is a well, mentor and a friend of mine and um, uh, we go back a little ways. So um, Daniel's uh, organized this panel is no stranger to the online space, um, has a blog on neuroanthropology.net and um, we're excited to have this uh, collection of um, papers and presentations about how uh, transformation relates to local environments. 
So um, I will let Daniel take it away from here. Um, once again, we're grateful to have everyone. If you have any questions, uh, we'll be available in chat and um, have a great presentation. Welcome everyone to the, uh, the Shape of Change panel. Thanks for coming out on a, on a Saturday morning. Thanks to Mark uh, as well for, for facilitating uh, all the organizational efforts uh, and to Andy as well. It's just, I know it's a lot. Um, we are all from the University of uh, South Florida uh, and a bunch of doctoral students and myself. And uh, the University of South Florida Department of Anthropology has also come out with an acknowledgement statement, which I'm going to read right now. Um, so the Department of Anthropology acknowledges that the University of South Florida resides in the traditional homelands and territories of the Seminole, as well as other historical groups, including the Calusa and the Tocobaga. Today, the state of Florida is home to the Seminole, uh, Mikosuki, Miskogi, and Chakta, and to individuals of many other natives groups. As a department, we recognize the historical and continuing impacts of colonization on indigenous communities, their resilience in the face of colonial and state-sponsored violence, and fully support indigenous sovereignty. We will continue to work to be more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Um, thank you. And uh, so we're gonna start off with Gabby Lehi. Um, just a note is, uh, the presenters will hopefully have some time. Um, we're planning about 15 minutes in a talk and then a little bit of short period for some Q&A. So feel free to raise your hand or to put a question in the q and I'll let Mark facilitate the digital side of it. Um, and I can just uh, facilitate um, the, if I can see it side or we'll figure that one out. Um, but without further ado, here is um, Gabby with her presentation. Hello everyone and good morning. Thank you again for joining us and thank you for hosting this panel. I'm very excited to um, be on this panel. I haven't uh, engaged much with the anthropology of consciousness so this is my first time and I'm really excited to be here um, and, and be doing this with everyone. So as said, my name is um, Gabby or Gabrielle Lehigh. I'm a third year PhD candidate at USF um, and I'm gonna talk to you today about the unspeakable pleasures of psychedelics and healing and how recreational psychedelic use can reconfigure social and cultural landscapes. So um, many of us may know uh, that we are in the midst of a psychedelic renaissance. We're seeing a plethora of research coming out about the various uses of psychedelics and treatment of a diversity of physical and mental ailments um, along with this uh, a kind of uprising of various types of psychedelic research centers and institutions along with that um, and engaging in that creation of knowledge. Um, just as a little refresher for those of you who, who may be a little unfamiliar or just need kind of a reminder, some of the things that are coming out in terms of research in the last decade on this topic include the use of psychedelics like psilocybin, MDMA, Ibogaine, LSD, ketamine, DMT, and ayahuasca in the treatment of things like anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance use disorders, um, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And we're seeing, um, you know, new studies being uh, prom um, promoted and, and, you know, talked about every day, including, I know they just came out with a new one the other day talking about the use of DMT for stroke victims. Um, and I think it's really important that we talk about the how the research surrounding the beneficial uses of psychedelics is important to not only combating the physical and the mental ailments that people suffer from, but it also helps to move forward in fighting against the social and the racial injustices that are, that are inherently intertwined with drug use and drug policy. Um, but I think it's also really important that we that we also acknowledge, and I'm sure many of us do, that there's several shortcomings with this pathological kind of or biomedical focus on, on the therapeutic uh, benefits of psychedelics. Um, and one of the largest kind of shortcomings that I see is this divide between the biomedical model and the cultural models that of, of drug use, of substance use, and of psychedelic use. Um, and so I want to acknowledge that it's no really, it's no longer productive to investigate these elusive phenomenon of psychedelic experiences from either of these kind of silos. And so what I want to do in this presentation is I want to discuss what I see as just one of the many possible ways to potentially bridge this divide. So I'm going to do this by talking about um, and presenting a series of ideas that I'm using in my own dissertation research called chemoethnography. And I'll talk about how these ideas in my project, um, how I use them to study 
uh, transformative psychedelic experiences at music festivals. Um, and I won't discuss my whole project, but I'll discuss a very small portion of it that, that looks at a particular kind of experience, which is that experience of pleasure induced by psychedelic use in this particular setting. And I'll use that as an example of how I engage with chemoethnography um, and then talk about how that largely can kind of help us move forward to bridge this divide and this dichotomy between bio biomedical and cultural perspectives. So um, I bring up this idea or these ideas of chemoethnography. What does that mean? Oddly enough, there isn't really a foundation of study. There isn't really a field or a definition of chemoethnography. It's really a makeshift kind of compilation of thoughts, ideas, and practices from a diversity of fields that include biology, chemistry, ecology, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, and really any other field of study that you would be interested in bringing into it. Um, but it, it ultimately uses those qualitative methods that we often engage in with anthropology. Um, along with all of these other types of fields of study that you can bring in. But even though we don't have a specific definition or foundation of what it means, Shapiro and Kirksky 2017 use chemoethnography to ask the question of how are molecular frictions, catalytic dynamics, and forms of not life and other than life reconfiguring our conditions of knowing, being, and sociality. That's a little dense. Um, so what does that really mean? So for me, that means studying the relationship and the interactions of people and chemicals. And what I mean by interaction is Kirksky's 2015 idea of interaction, or basically these symbiotic processes of merging people and chemicals and how those interactions create new social identities. So basically, this looks like studying how chemical, biological, social, human, and non-human actors create and recreate ways of being and meaning between each other. Um, it's a little bit of an abstract concept, but it's really cool because um, one of my favorite parts about it is as researchers, it gives us the freedom and the flexibility to shape and define and mold chemoethnography in ways that we see fit our research um, interests best. So the big question kind of becomes, how can we use chemoethnography to merge the biological with the chemical? On one hand, we have kind of the biological or even the pharmacological. These are, these are the chemicals that people come in contact with and they engage with and looking at how these chemicals interact with people. So for example, how they interact within the brain or within the, the biology of the body. So for me, this looks like studying the chemical interactions of psychedelics within the body. And I'll talk a little bit more of a more specific example of that in a minute here. Then there's also the cultural perspective, which considers how people interact with people and things. Um, so for my study, that means looking at how people engage with um, things in their environment or how they socialize with other people in ways that create meaningful experience and that create different types of psychedelic experiences. So bringing these two ideas together, chemoethnography for me essentially asks how do sociocultural context and biological interactions with chemicals merge to create an experience of meaning for people. Um, so I'll take kind of the rest of my time to specifically talk about how I use chemoethnography and how it can look in what it can look like in practice by focusing on this very specific portion of my research. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in looking at is the specific experience of pleasure that comes from psychedelic use. Um, and I'm interested in pleasure because it has the potential to generate a sense of healing for some people. And so it can add value to understanding the healing potential of psychedelic experiences from a recreational perspective, which is often something that is very elusive in the literature and, and really pleasure is often talked about in these very um, moralistic ways of it being something that's uncontrollable or, or sinful in a way. So it kind of redefines what pleasure can mean to people um, in a very understudied setting, which is the recreational setting, um, and taking these experiences and then being able to apply them to other settings like, like the clinical models. So one way to view the pleasure of psychedelic experiences is, again, through this biological perspective, which we often see already. Um, so, for example, we see how chemical molecules such as MDMA function within the brain and create um, feelings and sensations of pleasure. Um, so, so we know that M the MDMA molecule attaches to various 5-HT receptors within the brain, and it can create different type of physiological effects within the body, and some of those effects can be um, just enhanced pleasurable sensations through, through touch. Um, and then there's also other sensations like increasing feelings of happiness, peace, 
ecstasy, euphoria, bliss, and unity. And so that's kind of what creates this sensation of pleasure in terms of the biological or pharmacological effects of using psychedelics. There's also the sociocultural context. Um, and one example that we can, we can pull from is it actually comes from um, you know, the, the drug studies literature or substance use literature of, of how people use social groups to mediate substance use. So, um, so people use their social groups to learn um, and gain knowledge on how to responsibly use substances, including psychedelics. And so they learn how, how to take a substance, what substances to take, what substances they can combine or they should avoid combining, um, when to take them and what activities and things to do while on these substances in order to heighten various types of aspects of the experience. So for instance, one of those um, activities is uh, with MDMA and, and particularly recreational music festival um, settings is, is the act of dancing and socializing with people within that setting and that can create pleasure for people. So again, we come back to the question of how, how do I merge these things together, the biological and the sociocultural. I think one way to do this is to use the chemoethnographic approach to study these practices of use within context and find these very particular instances where the boundaries between um, the, the biomedical or the pharmacological merge or get kind of squishy with, um, with the sociocultural context. So for instance, people get pleasure. I'd mentioned people get pleasure out of dancing while on MDMA. And I think this is a really interesting example um, of how pleasure is kind of created through the pharmacological and the sociocultural. So, um, it, so when we look at, because it transverses these boundaries, um, it brings them together. So we know that physical movement of the body, we know that working out, we know that dancing creates physiological effects in the body that create sensations of pleasure. But we also know that the act of dancing um, is, is placed within a sociocultural construction of, of what I call bodies in motion, really, or bodies in context. So it's more, it's more than just, you know, watching what people do in practice. It's more than just going to a festival and just watching people dance around on drugs, right? Um, chemoethnography really allows us to build a framework where we can identify and examine the very instances of interaction um, in the very moments that they happen. So it's this kind of process of hunting for these moments where the pharmacological effects of a substance like MDMA and the social mediation of substance use along with the physiological enhancements of dance and movement and social interaction, they all kind of come together in these very collective moments of experience and meaning making. So like I said, it's not just looking at what people are doing, but really specifically looking and searching out for these moments where these boundaries dissolve and, and saying these are the moments of interaction and asking what exactly is going on here. Um, and I think this is something that just taking the biological or the cultural studies um, in their respective kind of um, perspectives, they, they, can't, they don't allow us to be able to see these moments. Um, but chemoethnography uh, provides us one set of ideas and a direction in, in, in order to be able to do this. So what does this mean for addressing the shortcomings of the biomedical um, model, essentially, of, of understanding psychedelic therapy and psychedelic benefits? Um, I would argue that first it presents these novel ways of theoretically framing research. Instead of just studying you know, the biological effects of a substance on the body, a chemoethnographic application begs researchers to search for these squishy, messy interactions between the biological and the sociocultural context of substance use. Um, and I would kind of further argue that it begs us to also push for more interdisciplinary research on these topics in order to merge them. Second, it requires clinical researchers to consider how clinical studies are conducted. It begs um, researchers to ask questions about how to incorporate sociocultural context into clinical research designs and question what aspects of sociocultural context already exist in clinical practices that are contributing to patient experiential outcomes, but may be overlooked by that strictly clinical or biomedical model. Um, and then finally, the chemoethnographic approach really gives insights to all researchers across the board to ask new questions that can change clinical practices and clinical studies. Um, questions like how do structural factors like identity characteristics influence clinical experiences of psychedelic psychotherapy? How does social connectedness within clinical psychedelic therapy enable a diversity of, of experiences for patients?
What forms of self-expression like dance and art can be incorporated into clinical practice to enhance feelings of pleasure and promote healing? Um, and what do people do in practice that can also be incorporated into clinical designs or therapy and healing? Um, these are just kind of a few considerations that you know I, I think of when I think of chemoethnography and what it can do. Um, within our fields of research and our kind of interests. Um, and I really encourage everyone to dive into chemoethnography and embrace its freedom and its flexibility to form to the needs of your research um, and use it as a way to engage and um, blur boundaries between the biomedical and the sociocultural and increase communication and academic inquiry into these kind of two constructs um, and figure out kind of and, and contribute to the over idea of what it means to be human and what it means to make meaning out of that. So that's all I have. Um, thank you. And I'm, I'm um, open to any questions or, or discussion on that. Thanks, Gabby. You do have a few minutes uh, left. And just a FYI for uh, the other panels, I will put my video on sort of at 15 minutes. Um, and we're planning about 20 minutes. So that's just a signal that I that you're right up in your time, but you hit 14. So there is a Q&A question um, from uh, Micah, which says, thanks for a very interesting talk. I'm wondering what chemoethnography looks and feels like in practice as a methodology. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really great question. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, it's tough because we only get so much time to talk. Um, otherwise, I totally would have loved to include that, but I'm glad you brought it up that way. I, I do get a chance to talk about it. Um, so I mentioned like qualitative methods. Um, some of the things that I propose in, in my dissertation is using um, narrative interviews, but specifically using things like, um, I'm trying to, uh, uh, the term escapes me at the moment, um, near, there it's what it, near experience interviewing techniques. So, um, you know, narrative interviews essentially ask an individual in my, in my, um, in my research, it would be asking an, an individual, you know, give me the timeline of events of a very specific transformative experience for you, you know, start at the beginning and go to the end. And then, um, and then I use these near experience interviewing techniques to get to um, more of the in-depth things, you know, what did you feel within this moment? What kind of um, lines of thought did you have going through your head? Um, what physical sensations did you have in the body? Um, when you looked at this particular piece of art, how did it make you feel? Were there any particular emotions that arose for you? Um, kind of getting at these, you know, asking these very sensorial kind of questions, um, which kind of get to what does chemoethnography look and feel like in practice. Um, but that's just one of many ways. And that's one particular method that, that I'm using. Um, and I'm sure there's other, but that, that's just one example. I had a follow-up question, um, Gabby. So you, you mentioned your talk, you know, really trying to get at what's going on in, in conjunction sort of where things get blurry. Um, but you can't study everything that's going on. So what, what, are, what are the factors that you think are sort of most important in that interaction moment to, to really look at? Okay, yeah, again, another great question. Um, as much as we would love to be able to look at every individual thing that might play into a particular experience, um, there's not enough time or lifetimes to be able to address that. So I would say, um, you know, pulling from Zimberg's um, um, classic drug set and setting. Those are three really big factors. What, you know, what drugs are people, what substances are people using? Um, how much are they taking? You know, the set, where are they at physically? Um, the physical environment that they may be in, how they interact with that physical environment, um, or sorry, that setting. And then set also kind of that mental kind of space that they're into. But I would also kind of push push that a little bit further. I mean, we're talking Zimberg's back from like the mid eighties. And so quite, quite a bit has happened since then too. Um, so we can also kind of incorporate other kind of factors in that too. Um, and something that I mentioned in the conclusion there is talking about structural factors. How do identity characteristics also play into that experience? So uh, in my study, I'm also interested in asking participants about their spiritual and religious background and understanding how that may play a role into the particular experience that they may have while on these substances. Um, even their political background, you know, different things about their upbringings and family structure might play a role in it too. Um, and, and I bring in the political side of things because, um, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the history of the war on drugs has very much 
I know for me, it's, it's very much integrated in my life, this idea of just say no, just say no to drugs. And that can really influence someone's experiences. So understanding someone's kind of um, political history and how their ideas have changed politically over time can lead to understanding how specific experiences um, are created over time as well. So kind of those are kind of the big factors that I'm looking at. I'm sure there's other things that um, I'll end up learning along the way, but those are kind of just some of the big ones that come to mind right now. Time for probably one more question if there's someone wants to ask one. All right, well, I, what I encourage you, Gabby, is to look at the comments. Um, there's some good comments and some recommendations there. So I know you're more focused right on presenting. So uh, check out the comments once, uh, once you're off. And we are going to now pivot to uh, Brie Casper. Uh, come on down. Ah. Hi, so you are uh, going to present on your research and I'll let you introduce it on your own. So that's it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, a PowerPoint that I have. Okay, I'm also gonna start my timer so I can keep my time. But um, this is my project on ontology and substance use triggers, understanding change through recovery. Um, and I think in a lot of ways really follows up, follows up really well to um, what Gabby was talking about in understanding how biology and the brain and things like that come together with the environment um, in a very neuroanthropological perspective, um, but kind of on the other side. So I'm looking at substance use recovery um, and all the things that come with that. So can I not, there we go. Okay. So. Um, we had to first start at substance use cues. So substance use cues are stimuli related to past use. Um, and it, so essentially what a substance use cue would be is, is something that um, is related to uh, use in the past. So for instance, for somebody who might drink a lot of alcohol um, or have struggled with uh, problems related to alcohol, it would be something like a bottle of beer or a liquor bottle or something like that. Um, it, but it's not uh, as bounded as that. So it might be uh, an environment. So a bar or, you know, a particular outside place where you used to um, meet your dealer or something like that. So it's just, it's just these um, like remnants of past use that remind you of use. Um, and it's based on this, the principles of incentive salience, um, which basically proposes the role of dopamine in substance use. Um, I know Gabby is talking a lot about pleasure. Um, and for a long time, um, and though pleasure definitely exists in substance use, particularly with psychedelics and other drugs, um, there was also a lot of theories of addiction that were based on pleasure that people just kept using because it was pleasurable and that was the role of dopamine. Um, and over time that's evolved to understand actually dopamine um, in our brain is actually reacting to um, cues in the environment or it's a, it's a, a context related neurotransmitter. So it tells us when um, neuro, or when we're near something that we need to pay attention to. In an evolutionary perspective, that would be things like food um, and things necessary to survival. Um, but in the drug use context, that kind of gets um, taken over as a way to understand uh, what to pay attention to in order to kind of get that, that reward, right? Um, and so the, the key reactivity theory is that uh, cues lead to reactivity. Um, and there's kind of three domains of reactivity, right? So there's drug craving, um, which is this intense wanting. Um, there's physiological responses, so like sweat, increased heart rate, um, and then there's actual drug seeking. And this can kind of happen in two ways. So drug seeking as um, having a, a drug. So for instance, I listened to the podcast Armchair Expert with Dak Shepard. Um, and a lot of times he, he's a, a, a person who experienced addiction. Um, and he talks about his journey through recovery and, you know, his drug of choice was really cocaine. Um, but when he would drink alcohol, um, that would kind of trigger him to really want the cocaine um, and go seek out the cocaine, right? So it was that alcohol is the stimulus to go then seek the other drug. And so there's drug seeking there, but then there's also drug seeking as the act of actually going to get a drug in the first place. Um, and so Q reactivity largely is created and tested in laboratory environments, employing principles of Pavlovian conditioning. So um, we see this in studies of rats, of course, um, and then, uh, but really Q reactivity is a theory created in a lab, in psychology labs. And, and it's, um, you can get people to respond to these cues, right? We can measure that in a bunch of ways. Um, but it really substantiates the variables of interest um, related to what the researcher is interested in, right? And so there's that kind of like, 
breaking down um, empirical research as inherently biased in its in its own sense. Um, and so it, it, the really the big takeaway is this has been remarkably unhelpful in substance use treatment. Like you would think like, oh, okay, if we can understand cues, we can get understand what makes people want to use and, and help them stop, right? Um, should they want to stop? Um, but it's not really been all that helpful. <laughs> um, and so that's where I kind, kind of come to understand substance use triggers. And so um, in triggers are very plainly the way people who are in recovery institutions, so rehabilitation counselors and things like that, um, and people who use drugs talk about cues, right? So these things that are created in the laboratory, this is like the real life substantiation of them. Um, and they're really, um, as Dennis uh, 2016 points out, there are things, people's memory situations that move uh, them, substance users, often in sudden and unwelcome ways towards drug use. And so there's these, there are these environmental um, contextual factors that really move people towards use. Um, but I think they're experientially different than cues, right? Because cues are bound to the laboratory environment and triggers are this kind of like, uh, concept that's created in in concert with recovery institutions right they talk about this in rehabilitation um and 12-step programs and stuff and stuff like that like recognizing your triggers and um what do you do when you confront a trigger and what happens then like it's it's substantiated in such a different way that has to do with institutions but also the actual experiential level of it um because you're kind of in your own context right it's easy to stay away from drugs when you're in an isolated environment it's very hard when you go back home um, and so the challenge here is to really understand substance use triggers. Um, so psychology has an ontological problem, right? They say the ontology of cues equals the ontology of, of triggers. And I, I don't think that's true. And ontology and anthropology, very, very briefly, very large literature, um, but to, to be very brief is um, in anthropology and science and technology studies, fixate uh, fixates on how individuals describe their relationships to nature and culture, um, taking seriously the individual's approach to biology, even if it's well outside the realm of like, quote unquote, science. And so this is where Latour's um, modern versus non-modern arguments come from, right? Modern is like this very scientific versus everybody else. So the West versus everybody else. And then Cohn has um, his book, How Forests Think. And so um, arguing that uh, the way people view forests and the interaction between the people in the forest um, is really like a different approach to nature that, that the you know Western view of, of medicine, biomedicine, and science don't really capture, um, and so it's it's really looking at alterity and the way that we understand um, culture and biology and the separation between them, and instead pushes us to blend those or to expand our uh, understanding of nature and culture instead of taking them as for granted, right? That nature is the same everywhere, um, and culture is the thing that differs. The problem with this is, in some sense. While people, while people really take their own nature seriously, depending on where they are, um, it, it ignores biology, right? So while there is this, um, this kind of alterity and things like that, it, uh, an antibiotic, to quote Harrison Robb, really, um, an antibiotic works in every context, right? It doesn't matter how you view nature but, and, and really the action of the antibiotic, you might view it differently or where it comes from or things like that, but like it works. Um, and we know that. And so there's gotta be room for ontology and biology. And so um, I proposed using this multiple ontologies framework that Harrison Robb uh, proposed uh, in conjunction with neuroanthropology. And so in neuroanthropology for um, at least the last couple of years, we've been talking about, at least in this little group, uh, triangulation. And so that's using this kind of mind, culture and brain uh, triangle, um, or if you wanna say psychology, anthropology and neuroscience, um, to kind of get at phenomena that kind of happen in the middle of all those things. So in this research project, I'm using key reactivity, this multiple ontologies perspective and incentive salience to really understand how the brain culture context are all interacting um, in really interesting ways to form this trigger, trigger experience and then how that um, is uh, implicated in substance use recovery. So very briefly, my preliminary research questions are both what are triggers, right? What is that real life thing look like, and that's the ethnographic uh, component of my research. And then what are cues? And that will come through a really descriptive um, study uh, of discourse and cue related research and, and really drawing that distinction between cues and triggers. And then how do triggers inform ontological experiences of the body or bodies in recovery? And so it's understanding the multiple bodies of recovering subjects and how they're formed interaction with, in interaction with triggers, structures of power and local environments. 
Um, and instead of following, well, obviously the study takes place with individuals as an ethnography, it's, it's focusing the lens on triggers um, rather than individuals. So how do triggers kind of flow through these different institutions and how can we follow triggers to understand that development? And what can we understand through humans uh, about humans through looking at triggers. Um, and, and the point of this is to kind of build this like local neurology of substance use triggers. And, and what is local is kind of different. Um, you can talk about kind of this local biologies and, and then what is local and questioning that. But this local neurology is here. There's two ways to look at it. Number one, outside of the lab. And number two, looking at it as um, as like as like what happens in their actual context in everyday lives. So uh, I'm going to really briefly talk about my methods. Just I'm using ecological momentary assessment, um, which is in uh, like in the environment way to assess um, what people are going through moment to moment. And so it's a psychological method. Essentially, people have an app on their phone. Every time they experience a trigger, they'll basically log onto this app and then you know uh, go through a quick survey about you know what they're experiencing, what they're feeling, and then also engage in thick description. So I'd like to train people. Uh, the best I can on, on doing thick description in a way that doesn't burden them, but um, in a way that they can really write about what they're experiencing in that moment, because I can't be there all the time. Um, so it's kind of employing the, the participants as researchers to really describe these cues or these triggers in the moment. And then obviously interviews and observations, both with participants and rehabilitation facilities and things like that. So there's some critical elements I've been thinking about as I've been going through this, um, and, and some I've talked about, but the synthesis of ontology and biology and bringing those together um, to really understand um, the multiple ways our bodies are enacted in different contexts and in different ways, um, and what becomes reality, but in, in multiple different, uh, in different ways outside of, um, outside of just understanding as nature or culture as a dichotomy. So as Gabby said, kind of really blending those lines. Um, structures matter. So again, referencing Gabby's uh, thing, you talked about, uh, you know, identity politics and, and the same thing is like these onto, onto politics. So recovery in the United States is a practice, right? Something people go through, but also an institution. Um, and that undoubtedly shapes what triggers are, right? Um, and so uh, a lot of researcher, several uh, ethnographers have talked about um, or linguistics and in, in recovery in the way language use in recovery shapes the process of, of quote unquote recovery. And so um, I'd like to do the same and kind of take a, a page out of those that book and understand how language shapes practice and triggers and things like that. Um, time is an element that uh, I'm not sure what to do with yet, if I'm being honest. Um, maybe it'll trigger some interesting conversation here, but um, uh, Triggers are at once an encounter with the past, present, and future. So in this sense, um, when you're encountering a trigger, you're encountering something from the past, right? It's a memory or something like that that triggers a, you at a certain time and place um, that is apparently important, right? Um, it's also you're encountering it in real time, right? And then whatever decision you make there is an encounter with the future, right? So what, what did, what's going to happen, right? Am I going to use? Am I not going to use? How is that going to influence the way I go forward? Um, and so... In this sense, time is no longer linear. It's kind of um, it's kind of all at once. It's all happening at once, and I, I think that's a really interesting theme. Um, and I hope to really dive into that as I understand um, as I go through my dissertation. Um, there's also obviously the question of consciousness. So, subjective cues are um, really uh, craving, right? So that's that feeling of craving that people get and can describe. There's also physiological cues. And uh, at least studies in the laboratory indicate that those two things don't necessarily happen at the same time. And physiological cues can be really compelling. Um, and research indicates that physiological cues can correlate more to rates of relapse than subjective uh, experiences of cues. Um, and so it brings to, to, to the surface this question of consciousness and, and what um, people are experiencing physiologically and how that interacts with what they're conscious of and then the continued drug seeking. So drug seeking is is really compelling, right? Um, I know Daniel in his chapter in the Encultured Brain talks about um, a person, uh, I believe, riding on a bus and then getting off the bus, like without even realizing it, like seeing a sign or something like that. And then just without even realizing it, getting off the bus and just like seeking and like, it just seemed so magnetic. Um, and so I think there's something to be understood there about what um, people are feeling and thinking about and what they're physiologically experiencing. Um, there's also the question of change. So uh, recovery capital, um, which is social, human, cultural, and physical capital, 
um, is in more contemporary ideas of, of recovery is um, how we understand how people change, right? So the more you build of this recovery capital, the easier it is to change. And so um, I'm, under, I'm wondering how triggers and recovery capital interact. So um, do people building recovery capital, is it easier when they encounter these triggers because they can depend and pull on that capital in moments of, of need? Um, in my thesis research, I dove into this a little bit um, uh, and found that it seems likely, but uh, I'd like to explore that more. And I think this is a good way to explore that um, in this project. And then finally, why I care about this, right? Um, and so I think the first uh, reason why to care is, is disabling, dis destabilizing the narrative of cues in the lab and triggers in, in recovery, right? So distinguishing between those two experiences, which are inherently different um, in different ways because of context, because of other factors. Um, and then also the methodological and applied implications of using ecological momentary assessment, particularly not using ecological momentary assessment itself, but particularly using it the way I'm trying to employ it, which is in a really descriptive ethnographic way, rather than just uh, um, trying to survey people really quickly. Um, and then a novel approach to ontology. Um, I'm a neuroanthropologist, right? I'm not an on ontologist or uh, I'm not, you, though I've uh, tried to become an expert on ontology, I'm really a neuroanthropologist at heart. So for some, you know, bringing biology into conversation with ontology might be uh, not, uh, not a great way to do it. But, but for me, I'm really interested in, in bridging that gap between biology and ontology. Um, and, and I think it's fascinating. So that's kind of all I have for you. I'm at 15 minutes and 20 seconds on my, uh, on my watch. So I'll stop there um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Let me stop sharing. Thanks, Bree. There's a couple uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, so from Hillary, wondering if in all this, there's any discussion about how the non-conscious parts of the mind make decisions uh, prior to the conscious impulse, say to pick up a pen uh, or a beer, where my triggers cues fall in this case? Yeah, I have the exact same question. And that's kind of what I, I talked about a little bit at the end there. But yeah, like, because there's these physiological reactions that apparently, are, according to these laboratory studies are really meaningful and can really draw people in. How do we get at those moments? And how do we uh, break that down? Um, I'm hoping though, through my observations and through um, my interviews and things like that, we can kind of break that down. But um, obviously, if it's not conscious, it's hard for people to talk about. There are EMA technologies um, that people can employ. So there's like uh, basically like Fitbits and heart rate monitors people can wear um, that hook up to these apps, um, these ecological momentary assessment apps. Um, and so, you know, for instance, if a participant's heart rate is just off the charts, um, you can kind of cue their send them a questionnaire and say, what are you doing right now? Are you climbing the stairs? Is that why your heart rate is off the charts? Or did you maybe just encounter something? And there's like that way to get at it. Uh, the barrier there is uh, funding for research. So um, <laughs> uh, that's uh, kind of the, the biggest barrier for me, at least, is, is having the access to those kind of technologies. So I think that would probably be the best way, at least at this point, to try to get at that um, in, in context, right? In laboratories, there's different ways to get at that. But in context, um, for my purposes, I think that would be the best way. Great. And the other one is sort of about a collaborative um, ontology. From Micah, do you work with any individuals who are involved in either Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous? If so, what roles uh, do you see sponsors play in regards to what you're talking about here? My father, who is a longtime member of uh, AA, often relied on a sponsor in his early days often by means of a phone call and often called upon in similar ways by his sponsees at present when they feel these triggers you're referring to. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important part um, of, of this. And actually, so I was able to do some preliminary uh, data collection this summer. And um, a lot of people I talked to were involved in these 12 step programs. And I know like the sponsor and things like that, like when I would ask them, what, what do you do when you encounter a trigger? Um, they would talk about reaching out to the sponsor. They would say, call somebody, get up and move, do something. These mantras that are, are much echoed in AA. And I think that's why I'm interested in also understanding the structures that are built around recovery in the US, um, particularly because um, those matter, right? Those matter in those Q encounters because those shape the way people move through those encounters. Um, and so I think that's absolutely a, a, critical, um, a critical part of the whole thing. And that's why for many um, in ontology, they don't really study um, they don't really study kind of the structures that surround everything. They're more interested in kind of more small level interactions and breaking down the, the distinguish, distinguish, between, distinguishing between nature and culture. 
Um, and instead I'm interested in, in doing that, but also um, adding in those structures and how those influence um, the way people uh, in experience tr triggers. Yep. And we have one final question in the Q&A um, and it sort of builds on a thought I was having about how, how what you're describing means cues are always relational or interpreted. But um, David asks, are you making a temporal distinction between cues and triggers, e.g. before or after 300 milliseconds after stimulus onset? Oh, that's a good question. So um, a distinction between the time that, that triggers happen, is that the question? Sorry. In a sense that, that so uh, if a cue might just be something that's has a certain time frame and then the, which might be not recognized by a person. Um, mm -hmm. David, if you're on, we're happy to take you if, if you want to clarify in, in um, person. Oh, I think uh, you have to, to, to unmute them. Um, so just do your best guess and then maybe it can be a follow up. Yeah, question. I mean, I think that's an interesting, at least the, the first connection I'm making there is, is the, the idea of consciousness, right? So yeah, maybe a cue is kind of that like first, that first really um, interaction and, and action right after. And then the trigger is this kind of like more drawn out sociocultural process that's imbued with a lot more meaning and things like that. But hopefully in the Q and A, David, we'll have a chance to um, to talk about this more when it's more free flowing. Because um, Bree's right already over her her time limit. Um, and I'll put this final Q, uh, Q and A question in the comment just um, so it's there so everyone can see it. Um, all right, uh, and that's from Tina Thank Fields. Um, thanks, Bree. All right, so we are moving on to, um, I actually can't remember if it's John or Kaylee who's supposed to go next. I don't have the schedule in front of me. So I'm assuming they know better than me. Um, hi, um, my name is uh, Kaylee Hoyt. Um, I am with the Department of Anthropology at USF. I'm a PhD student, sort of working out um, dissertation ideas uh, at the moment. So bear with me, um, I'm presenting uh, some of what I'm sort of considering as a, a dissertation project at the intersection of neuroanthropology and um, studies uh, in cultural heritage. So I'm going to be explaining this and kind of framing uh, some of these ideas uh, in the context of the African American Burial Ground Project. Um, it's a project that um, is going on right now um, between St. Tampa and St. Pete, um, and I'll be discussing a lot of these ideas through that kind of lens in relation to the project. So the title of um, my talk is Meaningful Connections, which I know is really, really vague. Um, it's very broad, but um, I think it's useful to kind of consider critically what is it that makes a connection meaningful? What is a meaningful connection? When we say these kinds of things are important or meaningful, what, do we, what are we actually talking about? Um, and so in thinking about this a little bit deeper, um, I came up with a couple ideas of sort of what I think um, a meaningful connection is. And you can see them on the screen there. The first one being an intimate form of engagement between people, place, and proximity to the unknown. Um, and also the product of salient storytelling um, and intimate story making that connect our consciousness to our shared humanity. So just broad base, um, <clears throat> the importance of meaningful connections is sort of going to be a common thread um, through my research, I know, in one way, shape, or form. Um, and a lot of it will have to do with kinds of, you know, creativities um, that people use to express um, these meaningful connections and, and tie these, our, you know, both our brains, um, the environments that we live in, our own kind of immediate <clears throat> habitats, um, and the stories sort of within them uh, into a form that's meaningful. Um, to us and resonates. So salient stories, um, stories that resonate with us um, for some reason or another, um, and also stories that work at high frequencies sort of to influence consciousness, behavior, and systems of meaning making both um, in and of ourselves and also you know, up through um, and including community, um, societies, neighborhoods, um, countries, et cetera. So tying together this idea of cultural heritage, you can see Louis Armstrong to the right um, playing at Manhattan Casino in St. Pete. Um, this is part of an area called the Gas Plant District, which is 
where the research is actually currently taking place um, for the African American Burial Ground Project. So cultural heritage, um, the way that I'm going to link sort of the, the brain and um, the brain heritage and systems of meaning making uh, is that heritage is a dynamic network of connections, pathways, and moments um, that shape who we are and where we're going. It's so in other words, it's dynamic. Heritage is not a static thing. Uh, it's this sort of series of um, interactions and, um, and networks that that become very entangled in one another, are highly contextualized, um, just like all anthropologists know um, culture works. Um, so it is, but it's also a series of choices to what we bring to the fore, what we um, choose to incorporate into our identities, what we choose to bring from the past into the present. Uh, and so considering um, both sides of that through the lens of meaningful connections, but also what becomes meaningful to our brains, um, I think is, is kind of a significant um, has potential to um, provide some significant insights into how things become meaningful to people and how and what, the kinds of things that move us. So again, um, heritage underscores humanity and context by bringing together past, present, and future um, in ways that can be shared, felt, and imagined. So heritage is a dynamic engagement. Um, thinking through the project, um, really what we're attempting to do is identify an, a story, right? Um, within the place, um, within the project, as well as combine art and abstraction. Um, and then using these two to, to move it forward, move these stories forward, bring, uh, shed some light onto the histories um, of the people that were um, at the Oakland site. And I'll get into this in, at the next slide. But, but really bringing um, these ideas together, combining art and abstraction to then again, make things meaningful to people. So the African-American Burial Ground Project, um, it's a USF study focused on the erasure of historic black cemeteries um, in the Tampa Bay area. So starting with Zion Cemetery in Tampa, um, it's a cemetery that was found um, located under Robles Park um, housing complex and in St. Pete, Oakland Cemetery is actually located, you'll see um, in the, the first photo up there, um, located under VIP lot one of um, Tropicana Fields, which is where the Tampa Bay Rays play. Uh, it was an area uh, that was in the gas plant district and the gas plant district was basically a site um, in historic St. Pete that had two very large gas cylinders on it, hence the name gas plant district, but it was a bustling, vibrant uh, African-American community that due to a series of developments, uh, redlining and um, all sorts of really sort of poor decision-making um, on the part of lawmakers split um, a community, uh, dissociated neighborhoods um, one to the other, uh, prevented these stories from being sort of shared and also um, led to eventually what will become the redevelopment project of the Tropicana Field site on the former gas plant district area. So the importance of sense of place um, is it's significant to the project, of course, because um, you can see at the bottom right, the interstate uh, sort of comes over the, the site of both Oakland Cemetery, Evergreen Cemetery and Moffat Cemetery, uh, we're now finding out. Uh, this was due to a redevelopment plan that was done. You can see at the bottom, that's the 76 or 78 redevelopment plan for the TROP to basically be placed directly on top um, of where the uh, gas plant district was previously located and to pave the area where these cemeteries, um, where these cemeteries were. And it's important to note too, that the interstate went in um, prior to the Tropicana field. So this is a, the stories embedded in the landscape are really one um, to highlight for this project, um, just due to the fact that they do shed a whole, a lot of light on the kinds of injustices that um, that the Black Lives Matter movement um, addresses and how we can now move forward um, 
and sort of addressing these in the redevelopment um, that's being presented in 2021. So this is what hidden stories look like. These are the gas cylinders you can see in the back. This was the entire community that was, um, was basically erased to make room for the trout field site, what they were calling an industrial park. The uh, images that you see on the left are the before and after for the now redevelopment plan in 2021. Um, St. Petersburg is, is facing a, a series of decisions now that will determine what it is that this field um, site is going to become. And so those proposals are in uh, and we are um, doing what we can to become um, part of that conversation and, and have a seat at the table when it comes time to decide what to do um, on the sites of both Oakland Evergreen and Moffat cemeteries. And this is what hidden stories sound like. The video I took standing at the site of Oakland, the local press. Um, but the, the important part to me standing there in that moment, um, so I guess, you know, it is what stories sound like, but what they felt like for me, I, I was back by how quickly people were moving by this area. I knew the history and I grew up on the lines, but all of a sudden standing there in that moment, uh, becoming very conscious of what was happening, becoming very conscious of the history that was buried there, and the cars that were passing by um, with absolutely no regard for for any of those any of those stories, any of those histories. Was, it was sort of overwhelming, um, but it, that's, you know, I think my point about the meaningful connection is that I really want to focus on what people uh, because unless things resonate, uh, there's likelihood that um, we won't necessarily be motivated to change. So uh, curate engagement through creativity. I think this is a lot of how um, this kind of work can be done um, is engaging the creative, um, engage with the, the process of kind of, you know, conscious improvising. And it can take a, a variety of forms. Um, if something is gonna be individually meaningful, then it has to be expressed in an infinite number of ways. So there's been a couple um, of ways that have been done already. And, and I'll already shout out um, to John um, for the video that he came up with, um, with a poet, uh, Walter Jennings. This is one of the the ways that the project is sort of tapping into meaningful, curating meaningful connections um, and, and building, building community and building sort of heritage moments just in the, within the project team itself uh, by having the arts really be part of the forefront of how we present findings um, and how we engage with the community members who were directly impacted by the destruction of the gas plant district and the erasure of their, uh, these histories and these stories. If the peace of the deceased is disturbed, can there ever really be rest for the living? When children are haunted by the ghost of coffins, who will sound the trumpet in Zion? What lullabies or lies are sung to soothe their superstitions? How long is the distance between time to mourn and time to move on? Between progression and reverence? Shorter than a school bell? Longer than a military exercise? Do black lives matter even in death? When respect is denied amongst the land of the living, then building a future on their bones only requires removing a headstone, obtaining a permit, circumnavigating a state law, Oaklawn, Ridgewood, Evergreen, Moffat, St. Matthew, chapter 7, verse 12. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Truth never stays buried. Hope will find its voice no matter how faint. Love is resilient, always smart enough to leave a witness, a testimony, stories that were not lost or forgotten, but rather ignored and disregarded. Clues to unlocking the mystery of its existence. Distant memories have become today's conscience. So ask yourself, are you really ready to be woke? What if everything that you know 
was built on the deception and deceit of others. What if we are ignoring Amber Alerts from the dirt? What if your giving tree was birthed by seeds that looked like me? What if directly under your feet there were whole communities silenced in an effort to delete another painful chapter in America's complicated history? The past speaks. Are you listening? I also don't, am I okay on time? I'm not sure. One minute. Okay. Um, so there's a couple different ways. Um, these hybrid forms of engagement are, um, I think really useful um, for, for translating academic research, um, passion projects, uh, anything that we're involved in really um, in, in anthropology, it all boils down to the human um, and being able to connect and disseminate uh, those findings and call community in as, as part of that process um, is important. Um, so, but it requires a hybrid kind of form. Uh, one of the, the directions that my dissertation might play with um, a little bit is the use of virtual reality in, in coming up with um, reimagined kinds of stories and histories that may not be able to be reflected in the landscape itself, but can be built in, in a virtual world um, and, and sort of playing around with some ideas about how you might go about uh, you know, bringing together the, the brain um, and, and heritage and, and reflecting that in, in built landscapes or imagined landscapes in virtual reality. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but that is one of the forms that I've considered doing. And this is my last slide for a very um, specific kind of reason. Uh, I think it, we talk a lot about bias um, in, in anthropology and, and transparency and, and how where we're coming from uh, and how that impacts where we're going and what the kinds of findings that we present. And I show the picture of the redevelopment project and so from 78. And upon looking back at this document, um, I did look at, it's a 300 page document, it's really wordy, um, but at, I don't know, maybe my 25th look came across the last page of this. Um, Corinne Freeman, the mayor there, I, my dad's from St. Pete. Um, so just as a personal kind of meaningful connection, I, I've never met my grandmother. Um, I knew that, I know a lot about her, I've never met her. And when I came up to this, City Council page, Corinne Freeman was actually the woman that read my grandmother's eulogy. So it was just brought everything full circle to me. Um, so the project is significant in more ways than one. And I think the, you know, the more the better and the more ways that we can represent that um, and explore it, um, I think is really where anthropology is headed um, with more humanized approach. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A at this point. Um, uh, there is a comment in the chat about a, from Cassandra about a, a very similar story in, in Georgia paved over um, graves into Cab County. Um, so so I, act, I have a question. Why, why do you think the, tell us a little bit more about the virtual reality, how that adds a, an important dimension that we can't access otherwise. <clears throat> Well, certain things have been built. Um, I mean, just just at, um, we'll start there. Uh, so there's different. So in urban environments, there are certain parts of the the landscape that have been um, that have been developed that are currently being used that are occupied by all sorts of tenants and things. Um, and they are they sort of have histories and um, histories in, in and of themselves. And so the, the ability to recreate something um, based, on, based on stories, um, based on context from people um, who previously lived in the gas plant district and whose houses were taken by eminent domain, all of that, um, I think it's, it could offer a really useful tool for understanding 
people's relationships to their environments um, and relationships to those stories when placed back into their own context. And so building, um, building an environment based on, based on those stories is, I think, could shed light on a lot of the relation, the kinds of like relationalities between people and environment and, and those kinds of meaning making systems. That's fascinating. Yeah. Because it's alive for them in their memories or the stories they share with their local uh, friends and family, but it, that doesn't have a way for other people to access because it's just the gone, it's just gone, it's been paved. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's that's powerful. All right, uh, we are at time with you, Kaylee. Um, so thank you. And uh, again, just to remind everyone, we will have time at the end um, for a general Q&A um, of John next, then I'll go, and then a general Q&A at the end. Um, also just wanna highlight, thank you everyone for coming this morning. I know actually we have a couple international participants. Um, uh, so that is wonderful to have people uh, coming as far um, away as, let me see where, where, where some of these uh, from Brazil and from France I hear. So um, really a, an international experience on a, on a Saturday uh, for all of us. So um, without further ado, I'll get to, I'll let John talk um, and I will jump back. Okay. Uh, it's, Really glad to be following Kaylee because she and I are in classes together. We're in the gas plant project together. Um, we are we are like minded about a lot of these uh, a lot of these topics. Um, so we're we're gonna we're gonna dovetail really nicely. Um, so I'm gonna put forward definitions of heritage and stories as master narratives, and you know as this and discuss this space the intersection between them. Uh, and I, I'd like to open up a workshop discussion with you all about, the, uh, about how they intersect and, and look, really looking forward to your thoughts. Um, we had two really nice moments that I think fell into this. First was the acknowledgement of First Nations uh, that opened this. Um, that was a way of navigating uh, erased history in the present um, that fits into the first definition of heritage. Uh, and we also had Walter's video, um, which was a present moment um, acknowledgement of erased history uh, in a constructive way in the present. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, my definition of heritage, and we'll get into this in the slides, is that heritage is about continually defining the, the past and the present. Um, whose past is privileged, is privileged, whose is erased, and towards what future present? Are we working? And which comes uh, the title of uh, my title slide, The Past We Step Into, was from the Amanda Gorman inauguration, inauguration poem. Um, and I remember, it's one of those you remember where you were when you heard something moments. Uh, my spouse, daughter, and I were sitting around the kitchen watching on live stream. And when she said those words, I got goosebumps. And I didn't even really know why. Uh, and you know the, this class, uh, the heritage studies with Dr. Jackson at USF that, uh, and the gas plant project that Kaylee and I are participating in actually helped me clarify uh, mentally and be able to, to verbalize why I got goosebumps. Um, and hopefully this will dive into that uh, a little bit too. So, and then for storytelling and master narratives, I'd like to look at how specifically storytelling and media are used as tools to define heritage in the present. Um, tools we used really well at the beginning in acknowledging First Nations and uh, I think Walter's video, um, but also ways that are used in cable news, social media, uh, and politics in the present um, that are equally intentional. Uh, and I think, um, you know, potentially uh, dangerous. So we'll start with the definition of heritage and we'll do a definition of storytelling and then we'll just talk about where they intersect. I will go back and um, so this space right here, I don't get into theory, but there's a lot of practice theory in here. That's kind of how media scholars um, for a while have been um, approaching it, or there's a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of habitats in there. There's a lot of docs in there. There's a lot of um, us using stories for our own uh, benefit and for our own survival, uh, to survive and thrive. There's also a lot of doxa, a lot of what um, comes without saying, what goes without saying 
goes without saying because it came without saying. Um, a lot of things that we just accept. Um, and so I won't, except in the discussion on how it comes up, um, I won't dig into theory specifically, but that's how a lot of this is approached. So my definition of heritage or a definition of heritage that, that we've been exploring is, is how it is the past defined continually in the present. And so I, I threw out these two quotes. The great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are consciously controlled by it. History is literally present in all we do. That's James Baldwin. And this is the, the part of the poem uh, from Amanda Gorman, because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's a past we step into and how we repair it. Um, I'm actually starting to get teased in our heritage class because I won't let go of Amanda Gorman's quote. I, I drop it a lot. Um, so maybe this will be the last time. I'm not sure. So in defining heritage, uh, I pulled um, these quotes out. Heritage is history processed through myth mythology, ideology, nationalism, local pride, romantic ideas, or just plain marketing into a commodity. Um, I think that that is done with story structures uh, in particular uh, that I'm very interested in and, and would like to hear from other people about. And by story structures, I mean um, beginning, middle, end story arcs, the 15 emotional terms that uh, script writers are taught to use, um, the turning points they're using reality television that became political television, and, and these kind of things. Um, so if information does not correspond with the way we perceive the world, it will be neglected, changed, ignored, or not perceived at all. And I think that speaks uh, to how groups build their own heritage in the present at the exclusion of others. Um, and I think that's done intentionally and un unintentionally. But when I read that, uh, I stopped and thought for, for a good while about it. Interpretation is the art that makes history real. Artists, especially painters, have known this for ages. Degas stated, as a painter, you have to transfer the idea of truth by means of the untrue. Picasso put it even more precisely. Art is a lie that convinces the, us of the truth. Um, and I, I didn't include it in here, uh, but Dr. Lindy had sent me a New York Times article that pointed out that more people are trying to lie to us now than at any point in human history. Oh, I did include it in there. Um, and we discussed that and I thought about it and I'm not sure, and this is where this workshop, uh, I'll, I'll try to leave time uh, to get opinions on this. If humans are trying to lie to humans more than any time in human history, if we just have better tools um, and less rules around how we use them um, sort of in the information apocalypse. So maybe note that if anybody has follow up, uh, that's an area that I would, I would so love to hear from you guys. So uh, stories, I say are, I guess can be, maybe that's a little too definitive, uh, a power tool to define heritage in the present. So uh, in, in, my, in my work um, on previous, on a, a book manuscript I actually uh, have out, um, I really dug into, into master narratives uh, and without realizing how they would connect with these heritage studies, um, that Dr. Jackson Cayley and I are, are digging into now in such, such a seamless and interesting way. But uh, Robert Fulford, who was a, a lifelong news editor turned academic said, a story that matters to us. It becomes a bundle into which we wrap truth, hope and dread. Stories are how we explain, how we teach, how we entertain ourselves and how we often do all three at once. They are the juncture where facts and feelings meet. And for those reasons, they are central to civil civilization. In fact, civilization takes form in our minds as a series of narratives. And in that, and this is a little tangent, um, I took a screenwriting class and what is drilled into us uh, in that class was that what really motivates stories are, are emotions um, and they need to be primal and they're, they're what turn the plot. Um, and that's that juncture where facts and feelings meet that I think we're seeing more and more of. Uh, in an interview, Mike Fleiss, who created The Bachelor and Who Wants to Marry a, a Millionaire, uh, address Trump and this is, you know, as he was emerging and, and all of this was sort of new and we saw this, you know, uh, reality television politics uh, said the future of the world and the safety of mankind and the health of the planet. I should have thought of that one. I think that there, and I'll maybe go to the next slide so I might speak to it. Uh, somebody who ran a reality show for 14 seasons had intentionality in how they constructed narratives 
and particularly story structures. So, you know, the slogan, make America great again, um, it's a campaign slogan. It could be a reality television title. It could be a log line, which is just the tightest way you, you communicate a narrative if you're gonna try to sell a script um, and or master narrative. Um, I think, and I love, again, this is what I really want to leave room for discussion. Is that a heritage definition distilled into four words? Is it designed to navigate uh, the past and the present for reasons of, of power, social control, personal gain, uh, and to erase the heritage of others? So it'd be, it'd be cool to dig into that as, as a phrase, um, which is sort of about story craft and story power, uh, how people craft these stories to be used as power. Um, Kleinman, whose first name I am embarrassingly forgetting right now, uh, talked about narrative therapy and how narratives can be used to implot people into a more healing life space. And his point is that narratives apply structure to events, ordering chaos into the one damn thing after another into a meaningful trajectory. So as humans, we seem to need them. Um, and they, they do have structure. They go back a long, long way. Michelle Scalise Sujamaya uh, studied old uh, folk tales from hunter gatherers uh, and their social purpose and deconstructed narrative into, into these elements, setting, agent, goal, action, obstacle, solution, outcome. And I thought to myself, how much of that does MAGA accomplish? Um, and I think it accomplishes a lot of them, especially when you put it with a common enemy. It's the, the socialists are coming, the fake news are lying to you. Um, I think you do end up with a setting agent, goal, action, obst implied obstacle to overcome, uh, and the solution, vote for Trump. Um, and this could have been on the other page because uh, Blake Snyder, who uh, wrote a book, Save the Cat, that is used uh, by screenwriters as sort of a blueprint to, to what a successful script can be, uh, speaks to the importance of emotion, back to the Fulford, that it's the, a mix of facts and emotions, maybe heavier on the emotions. Um, but people who tell successful stories uh, seek the most primal level of emotion. Um, so I, I forgot to mention that I have worked for the Tampa Bay Times for 20 something years, 23, uh, as a visual journalist. And I was working the photo desk, uh, I think it was two weekends ago. And this picture came across of, of DeSantis at the CPAC, uh, a political action committee in Orlando. And I looked at that America uncanceled um, staging. And I thought, uh, you know, and of course the rhetoric coming out of that um, was, you know, the woke cu culture is coming to cancel you. I mean, somebody actually said it like pretty much like that. I, th I think DeSantis said some things on stage, but what struck me, and we had a discussion on whether or not to run this on the front page, is somebody went and used metal and made those words out of metal. And somebody designed it. Somebody sat, you know, with a piece of paper and said, this is what our stage is going to look like. And so to me, it's, it's interesting. I mean, of course, uh, and Kaylee spoke a lot of this, you know, there's redlining, there's interstates, there is an architecture to how heritage has been defined in the past to create new futures. Um, but the intentionality of that, to me, rose, uh, I, I, we did in the end run it because, um, it's, it's out there, but to me that, that it felt eerie and possibly historic to have the governor sit under something that was so intentionally architected um, that, had, that I think has moved from doxa into habitus and practice. Um, and that, I think that stems from that intersection of storytelling and heritage uh, that Kelly was talking about before and, and I, I'm talking about now. So, I don't even know where I am on time. Um, so I guess I'd open it up for questions. What is a traditional role of the questions that I'm really interested in? And um, I, I would hope to hear uh, what you guys think. What is the traditional role of storytelling to navigate heritage, culture, identity, and the past we step into? How is storytelling and the way we use it to navigate heritage changed into the change in the information apocalypse, which is a catchy phrase for we're just getting a lot more storytelling with a lot fewer um, sort of social boundaries. Um, 
And more in speaking to the theme of, of this conference, um, is there untapped potential in that intersecting space? Um, places where um, acknowledgement of the First Nations, uh, where our universities sit and Walter's poem, um, what we can do as institutions and individuals to more constructively and intentionally um, navigate heritage in the present. Um, and what can new technology, which I think holistically has, has caused more of a mess than it's uh, been helpful in terms of a healthy society, um, how can we really start tapping into that to build safer, healthier uh, communities um, and acknowledge erased uh, inconvenient heritages as we go forward? So I guess I would wrap it up there and, and open it up. Thanks, John. So um, I'll just read one of the comments in the chat and then hopefully you can reflect on it. Um, uh, this is from Andy. As a mythologist, I've always seen narrative as an ancient uh, technology for transforming consciousness and algorithm used to create and sustain deep level of connectivity, meaning, and purpose for those whom engage in it. Um, so to, I speak a little bit more about how you, how you see that yourself. Well, I don't think I can see it any better than he just put it. That was really, I'm all like, okay. So, 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 so. Um, but there, there is um, some, some interesting uh, literature that, I, that, I, that I've uh, explored about the dawn of culture and the dawn of storytelling and how they kind of coincide. Now, whether storytelling caused us to become kind of a nondescript uh, not particularly exceptional primate to being the most powerful uh, animal on earth. I don't know, but they seem to have happened at the same time. The, uh, you know, Joseph Campbell and, and others have talked about the universality of storytelling. Um, and it's, it's really true. Some of these actual story shapes and arcs and um, seem to go back a long way. And so is that because they came from the dawn of civilization or a catalyst for forming the kind of cooperative groups that allowed us to be so successful? Uh, I kind of think so, but since nobody was there, um, I, I don't know if we can ever know that decisively. Um, but I, 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 I can't ag agree more and I, I can't uh, put it maybe even uh, better than that. But I think storytelling as a tool to form cooperative groups for mutual survival has a, a Darwinian aspect to it that it seems to me could, you could make a pretty strong case that that goes back 40,000 years to the dawn of culture. And then Mark is saying, I'm fascinated about the, about the mediation that institutions have in the moment and the experience of moments. They shape uh, these moments uh, and are simultaneously invisible to a large extent. Um, so talk more, some more about how institutions are shaped by and shape intentionality. So by institutions are, is uh, like media I Just take it, I think, yeah, I mean, social institutions, I suppose. Social you institutions. Can, you could be anthropological about it or you could be political about it, so. I'll just be me about it, okay. <laughs> whoever that falls. Um, I did do, um, for, I, I did a book, it's, it's Lost Storytellers and Ethnography of a Dying Newsroom about, my, about the experience that I had as somebody who entered the same newspaper um, two decades ago and has experienced, you know, when I, when I entered the newsroom, there were 49 photographers and now we are six. And I think that that holds true. So it's just been this, you know, this shrinking reality. Um, and some of the, the storytellers that I think local storytelling is, is very important um, to our communities and there's just, there's less of it, not just here everywhere, that's just, that's just the trend. But speaking to the institution, in doing that, I looked into our own history and our own history is um, very white male uh, patriarchal uh, and has not served the black community in St. Petersburg um, by anybody's sort of um, account. And so, that is how our newspaper was, the way it's been described to me by members of the black community here is that we covered the big things. We covered Selma, we covered, you know, the, the national breaking civil rights movement, but, you know, we had 
there was uh, the courageous 12 or 12 officers who sued for the right to patrol uh, equally in the city and it, during the civil rights movement. And they didn't even think about trying to get the, the Times to cover that um, until a journalist came in, I think it was 2012 and uh, covered the full story. And then now there's a monument to them in front of the police station and the story is told, but that was not sort of at the time. So these um, traditions of erasure um, are, are, you know, are evident in all our institutions, I think. And I just happen to have a personal knowledge of the one I work at because, you know, I took some time uh, to read the history and then talk to people in the community about it. I think that answers that. Great. Well, that's pretty much your time, John. So um, we're at 1130 and I still got to talk and hopefully have a little time for Q&A. Um, so it is now my turn. Um, I could probably just open it for Q&A just because I think my, my graduate students have done such a great job of covering it. Uh, definitely put a smile on my face to see uh, how, how they've how they're doing so much uh, fascinating uh, uh, research. And, and in, in my talk, I'm gonna go a little bit uh, bigger picture. Uh, that's sort of how I set it up was very uh, very focused presentations and then sort of widening the scope out. Um, and mine ended up being even wider than uh, I expected in some ways um, because I, I really wanted to present ideas about, um, about an approach to culture that I've been developing over the past few years. I, I presented on culture as constraint at the AAAs um, a few years ago, and, and I'm returning now to developing those ideas as a much more sort of substantive theoretical approach. Uh, and, but I'm not going to actually do as much about that today because uh, I was really sort of thinking about or trying to clarify some of my own thoughts on constraint and um, and how it how it works through different aspects, I think, of, of my own work, but also what, uh, what my students are doing. Um, and, and what I wanna highlight is that I think we, anthropology has struggled a little bit to offer a cultural approach to climate change, where it's often seen as something that's political economic or about reconnecting to nature, um, be, and precisely because we don't see how sort of a local view of culture, if we even use the concept of culture, can sort of make meaningful connections that, that make a difference. Uh, and part of my point today would be that one of the issues with this is that we don't, we don't have a theory of culture that helps us get at the how-to uh, of culture enough. Um, there's been lots of work on this. I, I could talk a whole talk about ritual and lots of stuff that's been done with consciousness or, or what Andy said earlier about uh, storytelling as technologies. Um, but it's, it's trying to push that to offer a framework for how you can start to put that together as, a, as an approach to culture that um, would have not just theoretical but applied um, aspects to it. And so what I really want to say about the constraint approach is that as a broad view, it just works with what is at hand. So it's not uh, an abstract definition of saying there's a system of symbols, a, a Gertzian approach, but rather it recognizes that there are limitations um, in, inherent um, in any sort of task that we take on as humans. Um, and, and then it focuses on how a task or problem can get solved. And this can apply to, to art and creativity. Um, and part of focusing on that task means taking account precisely what's available and how one effectively negotiates. So um, to use Andy's sort of metaphor about a technology of stories, uh, that would be a very general definition, but it, it has to take a specific form and attending to that specific form um, is where the constraint approach comes in, uh, whether you're trying to tell a story or understand how stories themselves work. And uh, so in, in this approach, I really sort of see constraint working as a, a, a way to do triangulation around how to think about and use culture as an approach um, that, that highlights some useful things. And most of my talk will be focused on the top part, but I'll just cover briefly the other two pieces. Um, originally, I thought about just really, really going into culture as constraint, but, uh, but I think the resonances are more important um, than what I just was working on as I thought about it this week. Uh, and so this image on the right here is really about when you start to think about the constraints, 
it, it brings into or helps us understand how some of the magnificent elaborations of culture happen. And uh, that it's, it's precisely because of how meaningful connections get made that you can do it. But meaningful connections don't just happen. They're not a given. Um, I think we need to attend to them uh, in how they come into, into being. So in this sense, it's a computational or a generative approach that is pretty common across a lot of sciences today. Um, with this focus sort of coming from neuroanthropology and how culture works between brains. Uh, that if you don't get it between brains, there's, there's just simply no culture. Um, but that part of doing that is sort of attending to those technological elements, as, as Andy put it, of what is both inside, to, to use Bree's approach, uh, between people, um, sort of in the experiences, uh, the intra-actions, as, as uh, Gabby put it at the, at the, at the start, and then sort of with Kaylee to look at, at these interactive elements that can both uh, silence and promote um, in some of the ways that John was talking about. And this narrow view of computational approach really is inspired by David Marr's groundbreaking work on vision, where, where he said, if you want to do good cognitive analysis, and this is a very general definition of cognitive analysis, you have to look at what's the task uh, involved and, and, and don't just do a functional analysis, say, you know, this thing is for this such and such a purpose, but isolate constraints that are powerful enough to allow the process to be defined and thus come into being in a sense. Um, and that this type of approach uh, is one that, as I'll call, talk about in a second, has been successfully done with, with language um, over the past 10 years or so. On the other side of the triangle, though, is the design part. And I really just mean this as a sort of a stand-in for art, design, heritage, and technology. Really this sort of bricolage approach where you're creating materials and means that connect with people. Uh, and the American Institute of Design, I think, has a nice uh, primer on ethnography design where they exactly talk about ethnography is open, more generative, um, but then it has to come to concrete form when, when you talk about design, and that's an iterative process. And that's really what I, I'm trying to get at with the triangulation approach. And then finally, the other is, is more a place marker for myself in many ways. Um, I, I think in this group, it, 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 one way to understand it might be as, uh, you know, sort of a, a Joseph Campbell or a, a Carl Jung, sort of the, the other, the shadow that, that the things we can attend to. Um, but I think it can take many different forms. Um, but it, it really works, I think, in the way that some of what Bri is talking about, that if, if the constraint approach applied to science, a MAR approach, brings blind spots to it and things you don't attend to. And anthropology, I think, has been wonderful about attending to how you bring in um, these other elements in ways that understand and help define what those constraints are. Um, and John spoke about this with the stories that are silenced um, or that constrain in such a way that they do not come into the moment. And I think that's a really important point is if it doesn't make it into the moment, then um, it ceases to exist in a sense for cultural uh, stuff. And then it takes work as they're talking about to, to get it back there. So I'm gonna turn back now to talking about the constraint approach as, as a more technical approach. Um, and a lot of my thought here has been inspired by this uh, Christensen and Chater article, the now uh, or never bottleneck a fundamental constraint on language. And these theorists along with some other theorists are really trying to build up an approach to understanding grammar that's a generative approach. In other words, you can get grammar because of constraints. Um, so it's a, not a Chomsky view where grammar is sort of just given and hardwired, but rather if you really tend to how language has to happen between people in the moment in real time, then suddenly you can think about why, why it has to work in the way it does. Um, and so in this sense, language processing is now or never. When linguistic information is not processed rapidly, that information is lost uh, for good. And so, so if you do this and then connect it to thinking about how the brain works suddenly and between people, then suddenly you can start to understand how grammar emerges as a way to share uh, information effectively between people to, to make sure that enough information gets by in that moment for a mutual conversation to happen. And as I apply it to, to culture, and particularly in the context of this conference, I really want to highlight that for, for my approach, I really think of conscious and experience as a key, key constraint on, on culture. Um, so if it doesn't make it into our ongoing experience, 
um, then, then it's not existing, but our ongoing experience itself is a constraint where we can't attend to everything. Um, and thus the sensory and behavioral aspects of, of the ongoing moment are really what happened to construct the meanings culture can and cannot have. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, but that's where a lot of sort of my thinking is needs to happen over the next few months. So I haven't necessarily worked that out. I have a lot of notes, but this is a, a moment in time for me. Um, so what I wanted to return to is this idea for, for how a culture approach to climate change could work. Um, and, and in many ways, climate change is just not culturally relevant to, to people. Um, and a lot of the focus has been on trying to you know, figure out how we can communicate science effectively to people and somehow magically that's supposed to make a difference. Um, and as John is saying, the, the science based or just getting a sort of a journalist approach, we're going to give them the information is not necessarily going to be the stories that people remember that, that there are plenty of other people putting out stories that will work much more effectively, the technology will be much more powerful. Um, and, and so we need to figure out how we can use a constraint approach to climate change that would make people connect to it in ways that are culturally relevant to them. So what does that mean? I wanna end uh, on this and then get on to, to the questions and comment is we can think about how to move come from constraint into action. Uh, part of this is really inspired by approaches that use constraint for design um, or that use constraint for therapy. Um, and, and by constraining people's ability to engage in other activities, while promoting even small levels of engagement in climate friendly activities, suddenly you're gonna make culture happen to them in, a, in, a, in an immediate way or a now way that, um, that will then create more uptake. Uh, but to do that, you need to support that. It doesn't happen out of the blue. It's not just providing good information and somehow magically it will happen. Um, and then to engage them themselves rather than tell, you telling them the story about the stories that they would want to tell. And sometimes those will not be easy stories. Um, they, they might have stories about how it's not a big deal, um, but you, we have to listen and recognize all those stories together. Uh, because in the point, if you do all that, then they will also have to tend to other people's stories um, and, and recognize that there's a diversity there, not just their one narrative um, that they value. So that's a really, really quick overview of how to go from constraints to thinking about some culturally uh, approaches to climate change um, and making it something relevant to people. I will stop uh, there and uh, take any questions that people have. Oh, I see a Q&A question, so I can do that myself. Whoops, I clicked the wrong thing. Um, Okay, so uh, Mike asks, excellent points. This raises the important questions of what happens to a particular culture when its storytelling traditions are co-opted by larger corporations such as Disney seeking profits and perpetuating ideologies of the first in society that promotes the status quo. And I do, I, I agree, uh, Mike. Uh, um, I, I think the, the issues is, and I was just reading something about Facebook and how they are before this, this panel and how they promote uh, the most extreme versions because it drives engagement, but creates polarization and loss of, uh, of understanding. Uh, and so there are really large actors um, out there and uh, that know how to do this really, really well. Um, and uh, you could say the same thing about addiction. Um, there are, they, they know the science of how to get you to pay attention to, you know, sugary foods. Um, and, and I think part of it is you try to figure out how to, how to combat that, but also tend to how can you set up a situation where the other things that Disney isn't pushing, say, are also fostered and strengthened because, through engagement. Um, so it's not enough to exclude Disney, say, it, you also have to strengthen uh, the weaker parts uh, would be one way to try to get at that. Um, so, and I'm looking at a comment here about uh, Joseph Campbell is a good person to reference um, uh, who relied on Jung's work on psyche and German uh, anthropologist uh, Bastian made the distinction between untrained folk ideas as a way to understand um, this. So, uh, 
so yeah, and I do think uh, as people have highlighted, attending to variation is, is one way to, we can figure out exactly this and not just assume that Disney is always evil or that the ways that, um, that the ways that we promote stories are always gonna be positive. Um, but to go back to sort of Gabby's approach to look at both positive and negatives in how people are engaging with psychedelics. <laughs> Any other questions? So I, I will now turn to sort of a more general um, discussion. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, and I do see one question here. It's, I guess, attended to me and then we'll switch to general discussion. So in the last uh, 15 minutes or so, if you do have just general questions, put them in the Q&A um, and also put them or in the chat or raise your hand and, and speak um, and all panelists can uh, answer. Um, but this one is more directly about climate change. Since climate change isn't perhaps directly experienced for some yet in North America and like unlike in Southeast Asia, I'm wondering if you can speak a bit more about the role of imagination as well as storytelling. Uh, I, I think that's it is crucial. Um, and and I think one way that we've we've tried to to do that is to imagine, um, you know, I hear about you know your carbon footprint or imagine the future for your children. Um, and, and so from my point of view, those are good, but they're still from a very particular point of view and not, not thinking about how to engage them in, in, in an experience, um, that would also ground their imagination in some of the ways that, um, say Kaylee would talk about of how you might, for example, use, uh, virtual reality to augment, um, people's in experiential engagement. And there's a question here above. Um, okay, here we go. Mark, um, I, I, so rapid cultural awareness that uh, happened with the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, election Georgia is on every minds, everyone's mind, everyone is engaged. Is that example, is that an example of constraint? And can you draw parallels um, between those movement moments? And uh, that's a really good question. Uh, because you're really asking me about the positive uh, examples. And uh, I, I, think, I think you're pushing me in a really good direction. I think it's, e I, for me at least, it's easy to apply this to understand why there's so much conspiracy thinking going on, right? Um, because conspiracy thinking, uh, you have, it, it, it's a cultural type of thinking and, and it makes perfect sense in the moment because you're drawing on available discourses, um, immediacy and all the sort of big science things that you might add are really abstract and don't make it into the moment. So I, I'm much more comfortable saying this type of approach could really work with, uh, to help explain conspiracy types of approaches and to really think about how it plays into, into it. Um, one of the things that I think I've learned from the activists is the importance of keeping that activism alive and, and that Black Lives Matter is not something that happened out of the blue, but was something that, that had multiple, multiple occurrences over time and represents a long heritage or trajectory in the United States. Um, and, and that if all that work hadn't, um, hadn't happened, then it wouldn't have been uh, prepared to like sort of burst into a broader consciousness um, because there wasn't a grounding for it. So uh, what I would highlight is sort of the, the continual work that people are putting in to make it make it come alive. Um, the same with the voting um, in Georgia, uh, the extraordinary amounts of effort. Uh, one of my nieces after doing work in California is actually in Georgia um, going door to door helping to register people to vote. So um, it, it this approach recognizes that it takes effort to make things get into that moment to sort of beat the constraints. Um, I th think that's how I'd answer it, um, but uh, it's, it's an excellent question. All right, uh, there is a, an open question here. All the speakers addressed or used meaning. Uh, so I think I've spoken enough. So we'll let one of my uh, fellow students try to answer this. Um, what do you all mean by meaning? So I guess meaning, I think that's a good question. I hadn't really, really thought of in depth. 
um, but definitely a probing question. Um, I think meaning in, in my project is definitely thinking about physiological meaning. What is physiological meaningful? And then how does that manifest in day-to-day in -day life? But then also how does ontological uh, meaning kind of feed back into that physiological, uh, those physiological experiences. Um, so I think meaning is kind of enacted in that relationship um in in some way um but yeah something definitely to think about uh, i appreciate that question does anyone else want to go or i'll chime in okay why don't you go um, gabby and then we'll move to uh andy has a question for john which we'll have to share a screen so we'll have one more answer on the meaning one and then we'll let i'll keep andy. it brief um i think it's this is a really great question too. Um, meaning in, in the terms of my project of studying transformative psychedelic experiences, there's a lot of layers of meaning. You know, what do, what does a transformative experience mean? How, what is meaning making? You know, how does that? You know, what does that mean in that aspect? What does um, meaning of a pleasurable experience um, for someone using psychedelics mean? And so I think from a little bit different from Bree's project, meaning for me is very much not even defined by me. So I, I literally almost can't even answer that question. Um, meaning is very much in, in my perspective and in my project defined by the participants and, and what is transformative or, or pleasurable or meaningful for them. So kind of a different perspective there. So, and that question was asked by Daniel Moorman. I just recommend to both of you to look at his book, uh, Meaning Medicine and the Placebo Effect. So uh, Andy, uh, I'll let you share your screen. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, fabulous, fabulous panel so far. Uh, I just gonna I'm gonna quickly share my screen because it's a visual question, and then I'll stop sharing and get the answer. Um, if you have a look at these three images, something John said really uh, captivated me about uh, the use of language in, in political discourse to to shape narratives of of identification and and response to the other. Um, and this this is an image from. Uh, the recent CPAC convention just from like a week or so ago. And if you notice the shape of the stage, um, it's um, it's designed with no practical, there's no stairs or anything here. So there's no practical application and folks have made their um, connection that it's actually uh, the use of this Odal um, ruin that's uh, had, had been used historically as a sign um, of uh, Scandinavian, um, uh, how am I trying to say it, uh, ethnic identification uh, in uh, what they believe to be their own occupied space. And so um, I was wondering the question, and I'll stop sharing. Um, the question has to do with the use of visuals because um, so you've all talked so much about narrative and storytelling as, in the healing modality and then also in, in shaping other aspects of individual and collective consciousness. But maybe if you can speak a little bit to the use of, of visual and auditory cues or triggers to, uh, to, to uh, move people into those spaces as well. Thank you. I hadn't seen that stage. Uh, I mean, I was viscerally, I mean, I'm just going about my business when I see the, the governor in front of this crafted stage and then you just took it to another level. I did not realize that, you know, if you had looked from above, you would have seen, um, you know, the intentionality of that, that, that is visual heritage making architecture. And, you know, it was the, the Fleischmann, he, he kind of broke down. It's, it's, you know, myths, symbols. I mean, archetypes can come in, you know, so many different ways that, you know, the red hat, you know, MAGA is not, it, I mean, it's, it's four letters, but you see it graffitied and it becomes sort of uh, not an acronym, but a symbol. And so I, I guess to, to your point and just to, to reinforce it, uh, first that's, that stage is, is shocking. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for sharing it. That was, um, sort of um, makes me feel like my my hunch about the creepiness of that stage is was probably well founded. Um, but to answer it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The you know archetypes are not necessarily oral traditions or written tradition. They, I think they come in all kinds of forms. What do you guys think? I can sort of jump off of that too, John, and, and talking about uh, symbolism and language and, and narrative obviously drives a lot, but um, there's this very like, um, shoot, now I'm forgetting, uh, symbolic tradition of understanding symbols and um, in ontology, right? And I think that's what first drew me to understanding triggers through this ontological perspective is, is this idea of like the symbolic nature of things, right? It's not just, um, 
language that we're looking at, but what does language symbolize? And then the communication between things as symbols and as actors to individuals and how that impresses us and, and uh, facilitates change or action in some way um, on these like kind of equal actors um, that surround us, humans and non-humans. Um, so yeah, I think that's a fascinating dimension of all this as well. All right, so uh, so we have a question in the chat, but I think if we just get uh, Tina to come on, she has an interest in time and, and asking something about uh, Kaylee. So hopefully Tina, you can uh, ask your question about time for her. Yeah, hi, can you hear, can you hear me? Can yes, you we hear can. Us? So yeah, um, when you brought up the idea of time, I was thinking that what you were talking about there was was the idea of eternal or fixed time, you know, when you were saying that the experiences encompassed the now, of course, but also the past and also future. Was that you, Kaylee? Or did, have I got the person wrong? Shoot. I'm, I'm on a phone. That was me, I but I do believe it relates to kind of uh, the heritage conversations as well. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, it was you that. Um, well, the idea is that there's more than one form of time. You know, in the West, we're so used to just thinking about time as linear and as particularly an arrow that goes from the past to the future, which wasn't always the case, even, even so. But um, the Australian Aboriginal people, for example, and the Hopi both have a view of time that is a lot more uh, vast. The idea that everything that ever was and ever will be also exists in the now, right now and is accessible. And this is the place of course, where folks can do shamanic work with ancestors because the ancestors are each in the eternal now and so are the future beings. And the Hopi, for example, have, have this concept as I understand it of coming into being that everything is in different stages of manifestation. So what we think of as real right now has come into full physical manifestation but for example, it all began in the realm of thoughts or dreams. And those are just as real, but they're just not quite as come into current manifestation. And so there's more possibility there. I think it also releases some of the tension around, well, this is not real or what is real or what's possible, you know, and how we can access these different areas of our experience collective and individual you know there's a lot of potential there i think if we just release the idea of the particular linear arrow of time going into the future so I'm, i'll be quiet now and open it to thoughts and i did i did um link an article i wrote which links to wallace's excellent article in the references if you want to look further so kaylee why don't you come on and and give us some thoughts about that yeah, so there have been, I, I know that John touched on it. Um, there's been a lot of conversations in our in our class um, with Dr. Jackson about how we connect the the past to the to the present, but um, being open to how these kinds of um, these kinds of concepts of time and, and history is brought into the future is is in and of itself a, a, a reimagined history um, and where to go about um, finding these stories and, and presenting them in a way that is both um, has an element of, of truth to it for sure um, and, and represents the, the communities that we're talking about um, in the work with the gas plant district in a way that that respects their history as well. Um, so I think the the time part is it actually becomes less um, significant um, in our conversations about heritage and bringing those um, different elements to the fore. I don't know if John would agree with that, um, but but it has been interesting. Um, I don't know, John, if you wanna like hop in. Final thought, John. Yeah, I'm looking, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's. Uh... I just wanna give you an opportunity to drop that Amanda Gorman quote again. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's a, can I do it one more time? Okay. <laughs> I'm not a groupie. Yes, I am. Um, but yeah, that, that, uh, that has, has been, and, and I know this is a, a preaching to the choir moment, but, but that, um, the power of that navigation, the past in the present, uh, and the tools we do it with, um, is, and it, 
both a, a daunting and exciting exploration right now. And, and like you all's um, uh, just a couple of comments here have already sent me into wonderful directions and just thank you guys. So we are at noon. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, and it was a great <laughs> panel. I will let Andy and Mark uh, do what they need to do before we sign off. Uh, but personally, just, yeah, thank you to everyone who came. Uh, thank you all very much. What a, what a fascinating panel on so many levels and great interaction in the chat. I'll have to say this is the most interaction we've had in the chat of any of the panels so far. So you all really sparked some wonderful interaction and conversation. Thank you for that. This video will be available uh, in the coming weeks on the Anthropology of Consciousness YouTube page, which doesn't exist yet, so don't look for it, <laughs> but it will be up for you to revisit. Um, uh, I want to throw it over to Mark because we are at time to make a couple of announcements, but thank you all so much for being here. Please have a look at the program for future sessions. We have a, a break coming that Mark's going to talk about and then another session and and then our keynote event for, for the day, which is a screening of the film Gather, which is a documentary about indigenous food sovereignty. Uh, which is wonderful and we hope many of you can join us for that so mark over to you and thank you again panelists and daniel you ran a seamless seamless panel it was wonderful y'all were pro uh, i just want to echo um andy's comments thank you so much for for showing up this morning and um wonderful content wonderful uh, interaction so that's that's the exactly what we're trying to promote here so um just a reminder, we'll have a 45 minute lunch break and then we'll be getting into a really great panel called uh, Resistance and Reclamation, Indigenous People's Responses to the Changing Ecology, which will feed in nicely to our screening of Gather, um, which is about indigenous food systems and um, kind of ways to um, combat some neoliberal ideas of, of uh, uh, eating and, and our industrial food complex. Um, as a reminder, so we also have, we'll be having a Twitch presence for the rest of, uh, of the panel uh, or the rest of the conference. Um, if you have any friends or colleagues who'd like to view, um, they won't be able to come into the session or they won't be able to come into the direct conference, which is reserved for the folks who have registered. But if anyone's interested in, in kind of viewing that content simultaneously, that's something we're doing to try to expand some of our reach. Um, as well as um, preserving some of these recordings. Um, those links will be posted on our website and also in the chat, um, but our Twitch channel is Anthropology Consciousness. So if you go to twitch.tv backslash Anthropology Consciousness, you can check that out there. But once again, thank you so much uh, for everyone's participation. And uh, we really look forward to um, the remaining sessions. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, you can email uh, conferencesac at gmail.com. Um, we'll be actively monitoring that throughout. And um, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions or concerns. And we'll see you back here uh, in about 45 minutes. So thank you, everyone, again, um, for your participation. We'll see you soon.